Let's look now at Jesus in the wilderness in verses 12 and 13. And let's look at the place, the period and the population of the wilderness. The place. Mark says wilderness twice. The Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness in verse 12 and then he's in the wilderness for 40 days, verse 13. The Greek translation of Isaiah 42, 1, which, remember, the heavenly voice quoted, with you I'm well pleased, in verse 11. That translation goes on to tell the servant, you are Israel, my chosen. The servant is taking on the role that Israel had of doing what Israel of old was meant to do, of being God's herald, God's servant, announcing the reality of God's rule to the world. Jesus, God's servant, is now taking that role on. And the, the wilderness is therefore meant to make us think of other wilderness times in Scripture, especially the wandering in the wilderness after the exodus from Egypt. That was a time of great challenge and great testing for Israel. And Israel failed to be the people God called them to be. Remember, they, they worshipped a golden calf that they constructed while Moses was up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. They failed in the wilderness. And Jesus is driven into the wilderness by the Spirit. It's, it's a really strong term in verse 12. The Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness because this testing is necessary and vital for his future ministry. The wilderness is an important place for Jesus to go. Um, those of us who are following Peter Walker's Lent videos saw some vivid images of the wilderness in his in his recording this week. It's fascinating to see how bare the place is. That's where Jesus goes. Then there's the period. Verse 13 says he was there for 40 days. Now just as the wilderness as a location recalls Israel's exodus from Egypt, the period of 40 days recalls the 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness after the exodus, before they entered the promised land. But this time, where Israel failed God, Jesus succeeds. Jesus doesn't give way to temptation, even though he feels its full force. He's tempted by Satan, but he copes with it. He handles it. The wilderness is a tough place, but Jesus meets the challenge of that 40-day period. Then look at the population of the wilderness, because this gives us a sketch of the battle that's going on in the rest of Mark's Gospel. Jesus has opponents in the wilderness, Satan and the wild beasts. But Jesus also has supporters, the Spirit and the angels. Let's look at both of those. Jesus has opponents. Satan is there tempting him, testing him, pushing him to the limit, seeking to draw him away from God's plan. Matthew and Luke give us fuller accounts of what went on in that period. In Mark, he just says that's what went on. But in Mark, this is the, the forerunning, the, the first taste of the opposition that Jesus faces in his ministry. And particularly in Mark chapters 1 and 2, there's opposition by evil spirits in a number of stories. And Jesus, who has been tempted by Satan and beaten Satan, is therefore able to beat the evil spirits and to cast them out. Even Peter, remember, is called Satan by Jesus. In chapter 8, verse 33, when Peter rejects Jesus' teaching that he's got to go to the cross and to suffer, Peter says, this can never happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. 
Satan hasn't attacked Jesus once and then given up. Jesus needs to keep resisting him. So this is one element of what Jesus' ministry is going to be like. It's a battle with Satan. And he's with the wild beasts, says verse 13. Wild animals are a threat to people in scripture and, and in reality. You wouldn't want to meet wild wolves or wild bears. They're, they're, they're a, a warning of, of danger. And those are there too. And yet... Jesus is with these wild beasts and they're tame. It's, a, it's almost like the Garden of Eden, isn't it? Where Adam sits with the animals and he names each of them and they come to him and, and he's completely at home with them. So there are the opponents. But then there are Jesus' supporters. The Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness it's the same word that's used elsewhere in Mark's Gospel when Jesus drives evil spirits out of people's lives. And the Spirit drives him into the wilderness as his companion. The Spirit walks with him through the days of temptation. The Spirit stands with him. So just as Jesus has seen the Spirit descend like a dove to empower him for his ministry, now he, see, he has the Spirit with him, empowering him to face temptation and to resist. And the angels waited on him, says our NRSV. The, the choice of verb is really interesting because it's the same word that you'd use for waiting on a table. So the angels were like Jesus' waiters and waitresses. They, they brought food to him. Perhaps, perhaps there's a hint that it was like the prophet Elijah's experience in the wilderness. Elijah, remember, was in the wilderness for 40 days and ravens came and fed him. And the way that the expression is, is written, we might put it, the angels kept on waiting on him. So for the whole 40-day period that he's there, the angels kept supporting him. Jesus faces temptation in the wilderness, but he doesn't face it alone. How do we respond to Jesus in the wilderness? We, he faced and overcame temptation to do things Satan's way. And our, our first response has to be thanksgiving. Thanksgiving that he did this and faced it to set the path of obedience to God and to self-denial for our sake. And like Jesus, we need to recognise that this world is a real battleground between God and Satan. But Jesus is the victor, so he's the one we lean on in temptation. And it's after all that, that Jesus walks into Galilee. So we're back up north, having been in the south, where John was baptising. John has been removed from the scene. John was arrested, verse 14, and we learn why later in Mark. And Jesus' proclamation is that he is proclaiming the good news of God. It's good news from God and about God. And in verse 15, he then, he then unpacks what the good news is. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. The time of fulfilment is here. All that God has spoken in the past, all that God has promised through his prophets, is now happening. And the kingdom of God has come near. God really does rule. God really is king of the world. That's what the kingdom of God means. And you're going to see that now. In Jesus and in his ministry, God's kingship is going to be seen in word and heard, seen in, 
deed and heard in word. Jesus is going to deliver people oppressed by Satan and evil spirits. Jesus is going to heal people suffering from disease. Jesus is going to teach people the way of God. And ultimately, Jesus will give his own life to bring the people of Israel and the world to God, to enjoy the blessings of God's kingship, to live the way they're designed to live as citizens of that kingdom. That's the good news. All that God has promised is being fulfilled and God truly is king and ruler of the world and Jesus will show that. And Jesus' proclamation requires a response. Repent, he says, and believe in the good news. Repent, turn away from your old way of living. Open your life to God's power and love. Change your direction and turn God's way and believe the good news. Put your full trust, your full weight on Jesus, for he is now the centre of what God is doing. And that proclamation calls for a response from us too. It calls us to repent, to turn away from thoughts and attitudes and words and deeds that put us at the centre of our lives. And to turn to Jesus as our King to walk with him. Lengths of time for reflecting on that. What are the things that are getting in the way of Jesus' kingship in my life? And then we're called to believe the good news, to live on the basis that this is the most important news in the world. It's not just something we believe in our heads, but something we live in our lives. We look for ways to serve Jesus as our king day by day. This passage is not about us. Just like the rest of Mark, it's about Jesus. So how are we paying attention to Jesus? That's what Lent calls us to do. It calls us to pay attention to Jesus, to focus, refocus our attention on him. Now, how about reading Mark's Gospel this Lent? I've produced a reading plan which gives you five readings a week or one chunk of Mark to read at the weekend and you can you can do that week by week and in the six weeks of Lent you've got plenty of time to cover the whole of Mark in 10 minutes a day or about an hour a week and ask yourself as you read what's Mark showing me about Jesus in this section I'll give you the link to my Mark reading plan um, at the end of this and it'll, it, it'll link you to my blog where the plan is. But how about we read Mark together over Lent and really take in who Jesus is and what difference that makes for the way that we live our lives together. <laughs>